God give us Christian homes. Let's all rise to sing this. The three verses, first, first three verses. God give us Christian homes, homes where the Bible is loved and taught, homes where the Master's will is taught, homes where we feel still alone. Shall we pray? We call on Sister Simpson Global to please come forward and lead us in opening prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for giving us Christian homes. Father, we come before your presence this afternoon. May you teach us and talk to us, O oh Lord. We will praise you forevermore. For we pray in Jesus' name. Good afternoon. Good well, I understand some questions have been uh, submitted in the box uh, back there, so perhaps I could have that box come uh, at this time. And I understand uh, Brother Isaac has invited you to ask questions uh, from the audience. The, uh, the questions have been uh, submitted, and you will ask questions. I, I would rather uh, characterize my uh, response to questions as a response rather than an answer because uh, I would just rather do it that way. <laughs> In other words, I don't have all the answers. I don't pretend to. So I will respond and uh, we'll, we'll see where it goes. But first of all, I have some questions. So if you're going to ask me to respond to questions, and it seems like I, I could ask someone here to respond to my questions. So I would like to, uh, how about the sister seated at, at the end of that row right there in the white jacket? How about that sister come up and I'll ask her questions. <laughs> So we, we need a microphone for her, and I see it's coming. It's coming. All right. yeah. This is going to be fun, remember? All right, my, my name is uh, Brother Darrell. What's your name? My name is Debbie Lee. All right, uh, thank you. I will, uh, is this better? Oh, it's better. Let's move this one then. Well, I just I selected you randomly from the audience. <laughs> 
because I'm, I'm curious how, how uh, like little girls think or young girls think. At what age did you begin to think about maybe one day you might get married? I think most girls. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> most girls, you know, everyone's different. I want to know about you. But me. <laughs> oh. Uh, from the time I was really young, I loved to play with dolls. And there's uh, eight kids in my family, so there were, most of my growing up years, a small child around. So it was just kind of a natural thing that I not only played with dolls, but I had children to take of, care of. So I, I always wanted to be a mother, for sure. All right. And then as you grew... Uh, at, at some point, I, I can relate to our daughter um, because I know that our uh, daughter began to make plans for her wedding way before she was going to uh, get married. Uh, when did you start thinking about her preparing uh, the possibility of wedding and making wedding plans? I guess I'm a very practical person. So I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about all the possibilities because that seemed a long ways away when I was a child. Um, little do you know how fast your life is going to move along. So I don't think I thought seriously about my actual marriage until we were going together. All right. What, what kind of a home did you envision having once you got married? And, and why? From the time I was very young, um, you know, we all come from different backgrounds, and so we uh, witness in our own homes our relationships between our parents. And sadly, in my home, even though my parents brought us to church, um, things didn't always appear on the outside to others as they did in the home. And so in my case, I knew it was helpful in some ways because I knew what I didn't want in, in a marriage, in a relationship with a husband. And, and how is it that you came to meet the lucky guy that would later be your husband? <laughs> So actually, I was living in Dallas, Oregon with a pastor and his family because his daughter was my friend. And so we got a phone call that um, this young man wanted to come to church. And so I met him. Actually, he came to church and sat with a family that was visiting. So we didn't know for sure if that was him or if he was with that family. Uh, but it turned out it was him and he came to our house for dinner and that was the first opportunity we had to get to know each other. And, you know, like, was it love at first sight type of thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I thought he was cute. That counts. Um, <laughs> that's a funny question. <laughs> I thought he looked really nice. But he kind of wasn't uh, what he appeared at first either because we thought he was very studious because he said he had to get back to school that afternoon to study. That really was not what he was all about. But. <laughs> and then uh, tell us about the actual wedding. We got married on Valentine's Day in Dallas, Oregon. How, how did, and how did you choose that day? How, how did it come about that you chose Valentine's Day? Well, we got engaged in October, and then he pretty much wanted to get married in November. <laughs> but we said, no, that would not work uh, for my parents to pay for our wedding. So then the date just kept getting moved closer. Sure. So then we decided on Valentine's Day. Yeah, her husband, her husband says that they started out planning to get married the next September. Oh, 
I can't remember. I just knew it got moved way up and then it got pushed way back. And then uh, the next day, I'm kind of doing this third person. Um, <laughs> we kind of said, well, then how, how about June? And then another day, well, how about March? And then how about December? And then it ended up being Valentine's Day. All right. So now, tell us about the wedding, you know, your dress and the, uh, how you uh, arrange the ma bridesmaids and all that good stuff. Um, since we have, uh, both of us have large families, Our sis my sisters, his sister, um, we pretty much used uh, all the people from our immediate family in our wedding and then a few close friends. So we had a large wedding party. The church was small. In fact, the aisle wasn't much longer than this and my dad is a big man and when he took me down the aisle he was going so fast I had to look to see where my feet were and the, it was over <laughs> before I knew it so that dream of a long walk down the aisle on the arm of your dad none of that really happened but um, it was very stormy and so we had uh, people coming from Portland and they had to come in horrible weather and we had people with the stomach flu because it was winter and so that it's not a good time to get married plus all the flowers are twice as expensive on valentine's we didn't think of that it was a nice day <laughs> and then how how far did you go for your honeymoon not far well actually we went over to the oregon coast and valentine's day in the u.s Falls. It was Saturday. It was a Saturday, and the problem is now we don't really do weddings in the evenings. We do them in, during the day, but back then we did them about seven o'clock at night, and so we left after the reception and everything, and went over to the coast, which is an hour away. And uh, it was very stormy, and we got to our motel about midnight. First, we stopped at a store to get some cereal and some milk. And the man that was, the clerk was waiting on us and we said, we had just gotten married and he said, it won't last. <laughs> it was kind of shocking because we had just gotten married and we've proved him wrong. But, um, <laughs> but we went uh, to the motel where we were supposed to stay and it was a small family owned motel that the family that I was living with, they vacationed there. So they thought it would be ideal. The problem is the lady that checked us in went to bed and took out her hearing aid. And so we, we couldn't get in. You can tell some of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. We, we, we had reservations way ahead, but when we showed up at midnight, uh, the lady was asleep. And so we called the pastor back in Dallas, an hour and a half away and said, we can't, we can't raise anybody, we can't get into our room. Well, he said there was a phone booth uh, close by. Uh, so he, first he tried to call, uh, and we were standing at the door, pounding at the door. We could hear the phone ringing inside. And other guests turned on their lights in their rooms, wondering what the commotion was, but the receptionist didn't, it was sound asleep. And uh, so then we had no choice but to drive back home an hour and a half away, and, and uh, so we approached our home at about 2.30 in the morning on our w wedding night, but by now it's the next day. How did the car run? It quit. <laughs> no joke. We were, and it's uh, between Dallas, Oregon, and the Oregon coast. It's a long stretch of countryside, so there's, you know, there's nothing. So we were driving along and the car got slower and slower and kind of stopped. So we pulled over on the shoulder and literally we prayed, Lord, we need you to get us back to Dallas. And the car took off and we made it back to Dallas. <laughs> and we spent the night in our, the apartment we had rented. And then the next day we drove back over to the beach and the, late, the lady, the owners of the motel, said they wouldn't charge us for the night that we missed. That was so generous of them. They should have added a night. <laughs> Tell us about your, your, chil your children. 
and well, their spouses. We're fast. We're going fast okay. now. We're speeding up. So thankfully, the Lord did bless us with children. I found out later that I could have not had children easily because I had some problems. But the Lord blessed us with a daughter um, after we were married a year and a half, I think. Yeah, and she um, is just a joy. Her name is Elisa Joy. She is going to be 41. No, 42 tomorrow, Tuesday. Tuesday. And she was um, a little girl that she had dolls, but she preferred to read. She's a reader. And she was just an easy child um, and still is. And then we had Randy, Randall, Marcus, and he was born two years later. And he's all boy. Um, he just likes to run around and, you know, be a boy. And they were both very easy um, children to raise. Um, thankfully, they both gave their hearts to the Lord when they were young and have stayed saved their whole lives, which we're so grateful for, and it's the best thing for them. And they uh, both became interested in people in the church, which was a blessing to us because we prayed from the time they were babies about who they would marry. That seems kind of silly, but... Now that we realize how fast life goes by, that was not silly at all because they did look for people um, in, within the church that um, had, like, interests and in everything, and then they uh, both got married in the church. Well, actually, our son and his wife got married at a park in Medford, um, but uh, they have produced eight grandchildren, and... They're doing a fabulous job parenting because I realize now parents are very busy. They have their jobs. The kids have school. They have all these activities. And on top of that, they balance their responsibilities at church too, which is just a huge load. But they do a better job than we did probably of taking a break from everything and spending time with their family, doing things just as a family, which I think is fabulous. We did some with our kids, but we look back now and realize we could have spent more time, you know, having fun, because you need that in your life. Amen. Well, thank you for being my random participant today. <laughs> let's, let's give her a hand, shall we? So now we have probably more questions than we can cover. Um, so we'll just get started. Uh, what, what do you think about young people dating? Well, I'll respond to that. Here's what I think. Uh, I think it's not necessary, and I think it's not healthy. Um, what I think is, is healthy is to have a group setting where uh, young people are together in groups and become acquainted um, on, on that level. Um, it's very unhealthy to have a one-on-one -on -one setting with teens um, simply because you're, uh, if it's in a private setting, you're putting yourself in a position where you can compromise uh, your integrity um, and it, it's simply not necessary. You're not going to get married anyway at that point in time and you may not marry the person that you are in that private setting with and if you accumulate uh, a number of individuals that you've uh, had that kind of a relationship with and then later you want to get married to someone who has not done that uh, you know everybody wants to to marry the perfect spouse well, don't, if you want to marry a person of high integrity, be a person of high integrity yourself. So it, it's, it's healthy to have group settings with uh, your, your peers. You can become acquainted on that level. Uh, that, that's, that's way better. Uh, Debbie and I hardly had, even after we began to court, we, we hardly had any one-on-one -on -one, uh, private time, not because we were really instructed very well by our own parents, uh, but just simply, it, it, uh, that's just the way, it, the way it worked. And um, that certainly worked in our favor. And I'll add one more thing. I didn't get saved till I was age 21. When I was a sinner, 
I didn't date. Not because I didn't want to, I was just confident that no one would be interested in me anyway. <laughs> but that uh, lack of confidence actually proved to be a great blessing when it came time uh, to marry. With respect to uh, a courtship, I'll, I'll give the opposite answer. Whereas dating is not necessary and is not healthy, I think courtship is necessary and is healthy. Uh, even at that, though, I still wouldn't recommend one-on-one uh, -on -one private uh, time. Uh, you could have one-on-one -on -one, uh, private time in a public uh, setting. But again, uh, what if the one you, you are, you're, if you're a lady being courted by a man, what if after a, a short period of time you can tell, you know, this is not what I thought it was going to be and uh, we're not going to follow through with this courtship? Well, again, you want to end up marrying a person of integrity, so be a person of integrity. And uh, uh, on the other hand, it's healthy to become acquainted with uh, the one you're going to marry before, before you marry. Can there be a place other than the pastor for couples to safely admit they're struggling without, without judgment? Well, I, I take uh, the position, if you want the counsel of the Lord, uh, well, for one thing, in terms of speaking to your pastor, your pastor is, is bound to confidentiality, even without us saying that, and they certainly need to be bound to confidentiality. I've had couples come to me, I don't even disclose that to my wife. She knows nothing about it, so that when she sees them, she, she doesn't know uh, anything about any of it, not, not because she can't be trusted with it, but simply because of, of uh, confidentiality, unless it was a woman uh, coming to me, who, by the way, I would not meet behind a closed door uh, in the new headquarters office, that's one thing I insisted upon, was glass doors, transparent doors, so that if I, then the door could be closed if I'm meeting with someone uh, of the opposite gender or anyone, as far as that goes, and can readily be seen by uh, my assistant outside the office, uh, then uh, that's a different, different story. But uh, uh, if you want the counsel of the Lord, I would suggest getting that from the, the pastor. I have suggested to some couples that they see a professional uh, uh, counselor outside of our church, but I have said that carries risk because you could uh, meet with someone, uh, so be very careful. You could meet with someone uh, who says, well, this marriage is not going to work. You need to divorce and start over with somebody else, which, of course, you, that's, that's contrary to what the Bible teaches. Uh, so if you feel like you need uh, tools, we are equipped to, uh, to provide the counsel of the Lord, but we're not equipped uh, to uh, provide the therapeutic uh, tools uh, that you might gain by uh, seeing a, an outside uh, professional counsel. Or counsel. Is it wrong to marry a believer not in, in this church and bring him or her into the fold? These are good questions, and they need to be uh, addressed somewhat together. The, the one you marry, if, if you think you're going to change the one you marry, you're in for a sad awakening. <laughs> you, you, you don't go into a marriage thinking, well, I see some problems here, but I will correct those problems after marriage. No, you won't. Don't, don't even think you will because you're not, it won't happen. Uh, if anything, any problems that exist will be uh, exacerbated. It, it will be magnified and be greater. So the question, though, the, the first part of the question, is it wrong to marry a believer not in this church? Well, it certainly carries a great deal of risk because your understanding of what the Bible says and my understanding of what the Bible says is, is that God gives victory over the old life of sin. Uh, most churches do not teach that at all. So you may uh, be uh, marrying someone unwittingly who sins every day in thought, word, and deed and has vices that you don't know about that will only be manifested af after marriage. So I, I can't say, <laughs> is it? absolutely wrong. I can't say that, but if, you're, if you have two people of two different faiths, uh, the Bible uh, does say not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, and you're characterizing this as a believer. 
Uh, but even so, two different churches, it, it needs to be resolved way before, well, which church will you go to? Where will your children be brought up? Where are the parents? If, if you're in two different churches, then are the parents in two different churches? Uh, where will all of this land? It's, uh, it's, getting, uh, it's not a very good foundation upon which to build a marriage. I'll rephrase this uh, 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 question just because we have mixed company and, and youngsters, but it, it, it relates to the intimate life uh, of a couple and uh, what is pleasing or displeasing to God. Well, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 4, I think, uh, that the marriage uh, bed is undefiled. The Bible speaks very little on that subject, so I will mirror the Bible and speak very little on that subject. Read Hebrews 13. But see what it says. Do you inform the church first uh, about your marriage or, or your family? Well, uh, there again, in, um, um, in Genesis, and it's again, again repeated in Matthew, with this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and, and be married to his wife or cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. There's no mention in there uh, of uh, the ministry, but the, the, the lesson that we teach is that when couples get married, uh, all others are on the outside, and in fact, uh, there, there's a circle formed. And in that circle is the, the husband, the wife, and the Lord. The closer each one gets to the Lord, theoretically, the closer each one will get to one another. All others are on the outside. So I ask a series of questions when I get together with a couple who uh, want to uh, court and want to be married and ask a series of questions, which I will get to some of them later. And uh, the, the way the questions are asked, well, I made notes on those questions. I'll get to it now. Um, For, for instance, if, if they think they're going to get married and want to begin aiming toward that, uh, uh, here's some questions that I'll ask. Where, where, will you, where will you live after you're married? Where will you be employed? Will the, will the wife work? Will the husband work? If so, where? Uh, how many children do you intend to have? And oftentimes I'll tease. I did this in, in Portland, actually, and those in the audience didn't get the, the joke, but I might, uh, I might say... Uh, to the to the to the bride, uh, the groom has told me that he wants twelve children. How many do you want? To the bride, well, the groom didn't really say that. I'm just teasing. Have you talked about this? In other words, uh, so these are some questions that I ask. Number of children after the children come, will the wife work? Uh, if so, how will the children be cared for? Uh, how will you uh, discipline uh, children? Um, what what time? Do you expect to eat uh, a dinner in the evening? Who will prepare the dinner? And I, I, I illustrate these things, but I ask the couple to describe or, or to uh, discuss these things outside of my presence. I raise the questions, but I want them to talk about these questions away from me because I tell them, I'm teaching you that within that circle, all others are on the outside, including me. So it's none of my business uh, to a certain degree what the answer is. What is important is the two of you agree on the answer or what it, what it should be. And it's, it's so important because your backgrounds can be totally different. For instance, I, I grew up in a home where mom fixed the dinner. Dad worked away from the home. My mom was a homemaker, seven children. Debbie mentioned that there were eight children in their home, so we both came from big families. We would typically eat dinner together in the evening as a family. All of us, nine of us, would sit at the table. Well, let's say I had, had n little understanding of Debbie's background, and uh, this isn't what happened, but let's say in Debbie's house, every person just grabbed something quick on their own, and they did not sit together as a family. And let's furthermore say that, that with, in our home, in the Lee home, me growing up, that dinner was at 5 o'clock or 5.30. So Debbie and I get married. I come home at five o'clock and there's no dinner on the table. <laughs> and I'm thinking, hey, what's, what's going on here? And my expectations were unrealistic because she's sitting, she's at home or whatever, 
this is all hypothetical, so you can make it be whatever you want it to be. Uh, but uh, she may uh, think she's doing me a favor at home by uh, making me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and put it in the refrigerator. And she, to her, perhaps, and this isn't what happened, so <laughs> I want to make sure you understand that, that uh, that, that was, would be normal for her. You see why it's important for couples to talk about these things, because expectations can be totally poles apart because of how they were brought up. So that's why some of these questions are asked, and, and I ask them to, uh, to um, like, who prepares the, the dinner? Well, some guys cook in America. Uh, so as I say, the, the, a woman grew up in a home where dad cooked all the meals. The man grew up in the home where mom cooked all the meals. He's come home, and the wife says to him, where's dinner, dear? <laughs> expectations. You ha these things have to be covered. You can't just go on one of these uh, online dating services and find out who you're compatible with. That, that's not biblical. Uh, that's not healthy. You're taking great risk because you know nothing about that person. You don't know how many relationships they've had. Uh, they are going to present the, the best light possible. That's the other disadvantage of, of dating. Uh, I've read that, uh, that dating conceals, marriage reveals. And you know that's true. Even uh, everyone here, we see each, uh, one another pretty much at, at our best, and that's true of, of dating. People get dressed up, and you're, you're sweet and handsome and kind and, and gracious. And, well, that's, that's, that's nice, but, but it may not be reality. <laughs> And once you get married, uh, you, the, the woman finds out she married a slob. <laughs> well, you married him now. So try to change that. No. No, you lower your expectations and just uh, find some good qualities to appreciate. But uh, anyway, we're, we will go forever if we don't. Uh, um, yeah, financial decisions. Who makes them? These things have to be discussed before marriage. What about your in-laws? Where will you spend Christmas? Where will you spend next Christmas? Well, one might say, well, we always spend Christmas at, at my parents. And the other says, well, no, we always spend at my parents. Well, how, how strong of an influence will your in-laws have on your marriage? Is, is your mother-in-law willing to stay outside of that circle? Or the, the father-in-law on, on the other side? Or, or is, the, is the groom's mother always going to be nagging on the bride to take care of my little boy now? <laughs> Make sure you give him uh, oatmeal and, and uh, I'm trying to think of a Nigerian food, goat meat for, for dinner. <laughs> All others are on the outside. So the in-laws need to stay out of the marriage. And, and to that extent... Uh, we ministers must stay out of the, out of the marriage uh, as much as possible too. I tell the couples, you know where to find me. If you, have, if you feel like I can be helpful to you in discussing these things, then I'm, I'm willing to. You know where to find me, but I'm going to stay outside of this, this marriage and, and pray for you. And, uh, but I do, through anecdotes and so on, give our experiences so it's, we actually have uh, fun, the bride and the groom, to be I think enjoy the sessions because they're not, um, well, because, because they're fun. Anyway, uh, so uh, I lost my train of thought, which might be a good thing. What is the right age of getting married? Well, I'll let you know, all right? That's what I told um, our daughter. I said, you don't have to worry about getting married. I'll let you know when it's time to get married. <laughs> and I told her that when she got in, into her uh, mid-twenties that I was going to have her go to the orthodontist and get one of those big old uh, strap things around uh, her, her, her head and basically make it so that nobody would be interested in her. But I was teasing with her, and she knew it. I can't, I, we can't, I can respond to that question, but it, it's not an answer to that question. I will tell you this. Those who marry in their teens are twice as likely to participate in a marriage that will collapse as those who wait. 
So you shouldn't be getting in a hurry to get married. You're taking such great risk. You haven't, even though we think we have developed and, and matured and are uh, equipped and all of that, we're, we're not done really. We're not who we will become. That means you are not marrying what that person will become either. So I, I won't give you a number. I will not give you a number except to say the, the longer you, you wait, statistics show that the more uh, chance of success you will have. Uh, Dr. James Dobson wrote a book, Love for a Lifetime, and he, in, in, from the American perspective, and in America, during the time that he wrote the book, he, he said, you know, it was statistically true that half of all marriages ended in divorce. But he asked the question that I still remember, what about the other half? Five or ten end a divorce. What about the other five? Well, think about it. What about the other five? Some stay together only because of uh, finances or only because of, of the children or whatever. But he said only one or two of that five have the kind of marriage that God intended when he said they too shall be one flesh. So it, it, ought to give, it ought to give you a pause. You would hate to get married at, at uh, you know, age uh, early 20s and miss out on what God had for you later. There's no hurry. There's no hurry. Okay, what, what's, uh, I'm not sure that this one here, I'll just read it and think while I read it. What's the stand of the church regarding a worker who made a mistake outside of wedlock and resulted in having a child outside of marriage? The worker has now retraced steps, confessed to his family. What position would, would the church take on that? And, um, Well, the, the, so if I understand it right, there was a child out of wedlock. Um, confession has been made. If it's, a, if it's a man writing the question who has the child out of wedlock, that man is, is responsible for financially supporting that child. Um, and if the question would, would arise, well, if it's a man, what about the, the mother of that child? That This man is now uh, in some way, even if they're not married and have no association with, with one another, they still are connected by virtue of that child for the rest of their lives. So um, I think if, if a woman was coming uh, to me and... Uh, contemplating a courtship with that man, that, that's the very thing I would be telling her. Uh, you, know, you realize there's another, there's another woman that this man is connected to forever. As long as they have this child and uh, if there's visitation rights and all that, you know, it, it, gets, it gets very complicated, but if, if nothing else, it, it reinforces the idea that, that youngsters and young people uh, and adults, as far as that goes, need to live a life of integrity so you don't put yourself in a position where you have these complications that jeopardize you and, and follow you for the rest of your life. So I, I, I apologize for not giving a, a better answer on that, on that uh, person. This uh, relates to dating. Um, so I, I think I've, I've responded uh, to that as best I can already. What's, uh, what do you do when your spouse is very selfish, doesn't have a spirit of forgiveness? Well, I'll, I'll answer that by referring to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's Debbie's favorite verse in the whole Bible. <laughs> it could be. 
but it's not. I mean, she, she loves all the verses of the Bible. But husbands, you think that through. How much did Christ love the church? Christ loved the church uh, so much that he gave himself for it. He, he, he was sacrificial. Um, so uh, I realize I'm not directly answering this question, but I have to speak to those that are not in that, in that situation yet. And, it, and again, it reinforces the idea of you need to know what you're getting into it before you get into it. Um, so if you, if you marry someone on a whim, uh, it's a great risk. But we husbands have a duty to sacrifice ourselves to our wives, for our wives. And you might think, well, that's easy if a criminal came and was, was attacking Debbie at gunpoint, I'd step in front of, of Debbie and I would take the bullet for her. Ah, that's easy. What about everyday life? What about laying down your life and setting aside your preference and setting aside your opinion and uh, having enough uh, grace to uh, be uh, showing a sacrificial love without claiming victim status. That's how much Christ loved the church. It goes on. Husbands, love your wives. Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. What's verse 26? And uh, what's verse 27? Okay, 28. We'll keep going here. So ought men to love wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Let's go back to verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands uh, as unto the Lord. That's my favorite verse. <laughs> but think about it. It's not hard for a wife to be in subjection to a husband who loves her sacrificially. It's not demeaning to a, a woman. Uh, hey, I read, I read, it's probably been a year ago, where a UK pastor... Uh, quoted the, this verse and, and, and blamed the wives for all the broken marriages in the UK. And a whole bunch of women quit his church. Anyway, I, I thought he should have countered that with the, the rest of that uh, passage, which tells how husbands ought to love their wives. So, okay, how do you, so to get back to the question, we go to 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, what to do when a spouse is married to someone who's very selfish. First Peter 3, uh, wives again being subjecting their own husbands, that, that if they obey not the word, they also may be, without the word, be won by the conversation or the conduct of their wives. So, you know, it may be a cross to bear in a sense, but uh, that is certainly... Uh, the scriptural answer to that question. And I'm glad verse 7 has been put up on the screen as well. Likewise, husbands. I hope that husband who is selfish and has a, a, a wife whose heart is breaking does not think his prayers are getting through because they're not. Husbands, dwell with your, uh, your wife according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the, uh, the weaker or fairer vessel as being graced together. Uh, or heirs together in the grace of life that your prayers not be, be not hindered. So our prayer life is contingent upon our homes uh, being contented. Why do we have a, a broken home in a Christian's home? Well, simple uh, uh, response. Uh, when the word of God is not being obeyed, uh, then uh, chaos ensues. So De Debbie grew up in a church home that she characterizes as a dysfunctional home. And I have seen it even as adults. It was a, a grossly dysfunctional home, even though it was a church home. I grew up in a sinner's home. Our home was a, was a functioning home. Isn't that ironic? Just because you marry a purported Christian does not guarantee that it, it will be a successful marriage or a, a, a successful home life. We, we all must continually die to self and uh, live, live for the Lord. Right now I'm just taking these questions. Is this okay? Or did is there a burning question in someone's mind? Uh, we won't get through them all. Um, let's see here. Something about paying bills. You know, uh, 
st statistically in America, the, the uh, reason for a, a collapsed home more than any other reason is disagreement over finances, even more than infidelity. So that's why we say who's going who's gonna to deal with the finances in a marriage before they're married. Share, there's a, it's, it's a complicated question, but that, that's why some of these things must be, I think this is the same writer, these things need to be covered before marriage. And I suppose the question would be asked, well, we didn't cover the, all these things before marriage, and now we're in this predicament, what do we do? What do we do? Well, we go humbly before God and ask us to do our part. We cannot change the one we're married to, nor should we even think to attempt to do so, but we live humbly and, and uh, ask God to help us day by day. Ah, I like this question too. Is it good for a, a, a Christian husband to shift all the home and children, child care to the wife. Well, let me ask you this. How, how did the children come about? <laughs> Husbands? No. It's a joint. I was very active in, in the, and Debbie would tell you that, in the, our ch children's growing up years. Um, and I, I'm active now. Debbie... Uh, does the cooking, but uh, every night I, I do the dishes. Um, you know, it's just unrealistic to, to think that it's her job to clean the house and it's my job to sit in a chair and watch her clean the house. Well, you live there too, man. No, you, you, you work together. These things need to be covered before marriage. And uh, after this session, if, if you're one who has shifted the entire burden uh, of child care and, and figuring these things out and house care uh, to the husband, uh, you surprise your wife by saying, you sit in the chair and let me clean the house. It's joint. It's not 50-50. It's 100-100. You're in it together. I think the rest of it relates pretty much to that. Oh, here's a good one. Is it a shame or, is a, or a shame or a fake marriage okay? Talking about getting married in order to stay in the country or get out of a country. No, it's not okay. Why is it such a buzz? <laughs> oh. I, can, I, can, I can take longer to give that answer. It's not okay. <laughs> the purpose of marriage is companionship. Genesis uh, chapter 2. Oh, you know, God said it's not good for, for man to be alone. He had all these uh, animals that had a, a partner but not a, a suitable companion. That's what help meet means, help meet a suitable companion, one who would complement Adam. And so uh, God uh, took a rib of Adam, and out of that rib made Eve. Uh, and uh, Adam took one look at her and thought, wow, she's amazing. Uh, she's my wife. And uh, that was the first marriage. And, and that's the foundation uh, of the institution of marriage, one woman for one man for life. And that hasn't changed. Can premarital counseling be offered by both the pastor and their spouse? Oh, the spouse of the pastor. Well, Debbie doesn't do it. Um, it shouldn't be done in an unsolicited manner, but if it was solicited, if someone came to Debbie and say, I want to ask about that. But remember, what we call premarital counseling in the church is, is the counsel of the Lord. If you want therapeutic type counsel, then you go to one who is professionally uh, licensed uh, and uh, educated to provide such. I, we stress that to our ministers in America. Don't pretend you're a therapist, you're not. You're a pastor. 
the counsel of the Lord is what you're to provide. And uh, we, we recommend books. I've quoted uh, the book of James uh, Dobson in America, well-known uh, founder of Focus on the Family, which about 10 years ago, by the way, he was dismissed from uh, that role of serving on the board of the organization he created because they wanted him to s uh, soften his stance towards same-sex marriage. Imagine that. So he uh, created another uh, organization. He's older now, well into his 70s and maybe 80, uh, and I can't remember the name of that uh, organization, but a, a number of his books would be available as well that, that are, are uh, good resource material. When I got married, Debbie and I got married, my pastor gave me a thick book. It, uh, it was called The Marriage Affair. I can't quite remember who it was written by uh, because I never read it. So when, when I get married or when I officiate a wedding, I didn't, didn't bring it with me, but I have a, a thin book that has all the same information that that great big thick book had, uh, I assume, after looking at the table of contents in the thick book. Uh, but couples will read it. In fact, I assign it to them to read it together. I say there's nine chapters. You read the first three chapters together, and after you've read out loud, taking turns reading or however you do it, and, and after you're done reading those first three chapters, you come back and we'll meet again, and uh, I'll raise some issues that I have... Uh, learn from those first three chapters and we talk about them and I encourage them to talk about these things outside of my presence and then the second middle three chapters do the same thing and finally again the the final three chapters because we will not officiate a wedding unless we've had an opportunity to meet with a couple uh, and, uh, several times over a period of, of several months so if they show if they show up and say hey we'd like to get married next next month oh well good luck with that it's not going to be me who's going to do it uh, but I don't, I'm not cruel like that, but, but uh, it is true. This is serious business. Physical abuse damages the body, verbal abuse damages the mind. How can the, the church stamp out domestic abuse? Well, the church can't. It takes God to do that. Uh, the, the church can minimize the risk of it by having a session like we're having today and helping the eyes of younger people uh, in, in the, well before they're thinking about marriage and even in their 20s when they might uh, contemplate uh, getting married. To go in, as Dr. Dobson says, with, to marriage with your eyes wide open and after you're married, keep them half closed. That is to not be nitpicky of every little uh, quality of life that you think is, is less than what you expected. Back to expectations. I will say that, that if a person's, if, if, a, if a woman's uh, life or, or safety was in jeopardy, um, we would advise such a woman to take measures to minimize that jeopardy short of divorce. We will not advise a divorce. There have been occasions where uh, a legal separation for protective purposes have been necessary, but um, we, we pray that that will, will not um, be frequent for sure. Oh, do we have a network of trained Christian counselors to whom we can refer couples in trouble? Actually, I have the names of a, of a few in, at home in Portland that I've uh, gleaned from couples who have shared confidentially their, their challenges and they've sought help and received help. So I obviously have kept the names of those, the, the people who have referred these individuals to me in confidence, but I have shared the name of the professional with, with a couple or two along the way. Because again, it's worth repeating. We, we will do our best to provide the counsel of the Lord. And, uh, but for professional uh, type counsel, then uh, it's somewhat of a conflict of interest. We're spiritual mentors, we're spiritual guides, and that's where we want to narrow our expertise. How can we keep a marriage alive and romantic? Well, interview your wife in front of a bunch of people. 
Well, I should have Debbie answer that question. I don't know. You know, life is a routine. And, and uh, manage expectations again. If you think it's just going to be a, a lifelong honeymoon, the purpose of marriage is companionship. That, that's why God gave Eve to Adam. So I married my best friend. She's still my best friend. 43 years later. I hope I'm her best friend. I, I was until I gave that interview. <laughs> so I used to be her best friend. So, you know, and it's worth telling young people, here, here's a, a lesson that I've also read, how young ladies in particular are victimized by young men because perhaps something was lacking in the home where they grew up. The father figure wasn't what he ought to have been. Uh, so she's looking for, for um, male approval. So she falls into a relationship uh, with, with a man because she wants, uh, she wants romance, she wants love. And here's what happens out in the world, and it could happen in the church if you're talking about carnal individuals. Uh, a, a young woman will give sex to get romance. And the young man will give romance to get sex. You tell me who the loser is. It's the young woman who is being used and then eventually discarded like a, a worn garment. So that doesn't relate to, to this, but uh, the question is how to keep romance alive. And I think, uh, you know, De Debbie and I used to go grocery shopping this uh, is hardly, you would hardly, and well, we still do some. We consider this uh, romance, but, uh, you know, a, a woman, her lifeblood is in, in the love of her, of her husband and in spending uh, time with her husband in the contact, such as uh, holding the hand. Uh, Debbie wondered why when we, it took me so long to hold her hand. Well, I hadn't been through this thing before, so I didn't know what was right or what was wrong. Well, she still likes to hold hands. And, and I've read also, with some risk here, because of the disparity of, of ages, that the, the number of stages that lead uh, to marriage intimacy, I'll say, and it starts with, with eye uh, to body, and this is not a, a non-sexual uh, glance. Uh, Debbie and I, for instance, were up on the hill uh, today and could look down and we saw people down here. That's eye to body. Those people didn't even know. Or you might even be downtown and you see people walking across the street. Well, eventually, uh, you know, I showed up at the house where Debbie lived and saw, I saw everyone. So there was eye to body and Debbie saw me. There wasn't uh, that I see you now. That's eye to body and you see me. That's the first stage. The next stage is eye to eye. And again, non-sexual, you could be uh, in an elevator and you hit the floor and there's somebody else there and you're, you make eye contact and you look away because it's, it's kind of awkward. But that's another, uh, the second stage. Then there's voice to voice. And again, there's nothing uh, uh, to this. You just say, good morning. Someone else says, good morning. So now that, that's the third stage. And the next stage is hand-to-hand. -hand. It can be nothing more uh, than a handshake, but it also can be <coughs> a situation where eventually you hold hands. So now you're beginning to enter into that romantic uh, the possibility of, uh, of romance. But... Uh, again, this is Dr. Dobson uh, saying this, those early stages are the stages that need to be repeated throughout your married life. And the problem that I illustrated a moment ago is the, the young girl or woman looking uh, for, from, for romance skips the first several stages and goes right to the final stage. And she's never, she never got romance. Furthermore, that does not sustain a marriage. 
it's, it's the, the, the eye to eye and the, the hand to hand and uh, the arm around uh, the shoulder in a marriage and, and the hugs. Uh, that is what uh, sustains a marriage. And if, if husbands uh, want a healthy, intimate life, intimate life and think they are going to get it by uh, skipping all of those other stages, you know, seven days a week, 31 days a month, it, it ain't going to happen because uh, men and women are, are built different and a, and a woman needs uh, those early stages of a relationship repeated throughout the married life. So that might go to the question how to keep uh, romance alive and, and healthy. Well, it, it starts by those simple things, those non-sexual things, and those are repeated. If you think you're going to have a, a, a good intimate life uh, by uh, suddenly treating your wife well uh, for two or three days in a row when you have been verbally uh, blasting her uh, for a day, I mean, it, it, it's a failure waiting to happen. It's not a failure waiting to happen. It's a failure that has already happened. It, it doesn't work. Anyway. Um, If, the, if a husband dies, can I marry another man? And from where? Well, we quoted that verse yesterday from 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 39, that if the husband be dead, or if the wife be dead, the husband can marry in the Lord. So I can think of a situation where someone was a widower, or actually she was a widow. She was a widow and married a a widower spontaneously it was it was, it was not good it, it wasn't in the Lord so I think I've answered that question actually I didn't answer it Paul answered it <laughs> uh, here's a financial question in a where the wife thinks the husband is forceful with respect to uh, finances. And, you know, I wish I could solve problems, but I can't. Is it true that, that, that it's the mother-in-law? Wait. Is it true that it is the mother-in-law choice of a wife that the apostolic faith church will approve the marriage? No. No, if a couple comes to me, I mean, if, if, if the future mother-in-law said, this is who I want my child to marry, well, who does your child want to marry? We parents cannot dictate who our children marry. You're not going to be in that circle. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to put that on the church either. I'm not going to dictate who our young people marry. Do you think I want to own the problems that later occur because they followed what I said they ought to do and, and end up marrying someone they ought not to have married. So we, as parents, we were concerned about who our children would marry. We prayed. We tried to guide our children toward independence. You know, they're not our dependents forever, either either... So we try to guide them and encourage them and cover some of these things as they're growing up well before it's time to even think about uh, getting married. They knew the homes that we grew up in. They saw uh, the relationship that our own parents had because they were still living, our parents, their grandparents. So we did our best to guide them, but we didn't, did not choose their spouses. Uh, my parents did not choose my spouse. Debbie's parents did not choose uh, me. Nevertheless, we had 
the approval of our parents before we got married. We had the approval of our pastor before we got married. So I hope that helps some. Well, is it okay to marry in the court? For someone marries in the court, do, we, do they announce the wedding in the church or not? Well, if, someone was, if it's not a church wedding, we wouldn't probably announce. I mean, I wouldn't. In Portland, I don't know. I don't know all the dynamics of the background of this question, but if a couple decided to go and get married uh, at the, what we call the justice of the peace or in the court, we would not announce that uh, wedding ahead. We, we would think it odd that they were doing that and wonder why they are doing that. It would suggest that they didn't have the approval of their parents and or of, uh, of the ministry and um, we would be concerned, although there could be a legal uh, reason for it. I've had uh, a case that I'm thinking of now that comes to mind where we actually had, um, there was a citizenship problem in that case, but they were not getting married due to the citizenship uh, problem. Uh, they were getting married because they loved one another and, and had courted and had the approval of parents and all the rest and of the church, but it was necessary to take the legal uh, step before they took the, the religious uh, public step. And th that's um, an occasion where that happened. We never did, uh, and I won't disclose now anything further than that. It was not a public, the first one was not a public situation. What if your spouse is younger than you and God tells them to marry you? So I assume they're not your spouse yet. So somebody younger than you, I love this question actually. Uh, they, come, they come to you, let's say it's a, a man. Let's say it's a man who's, who's uh, whatever age. They come to the woman and say, God told me that I'm to marry you. If I was the woman, I would say, well, God told me that you should go jump in a lake. <laughs> Don't use God as leverage to try to bind me to what you want for you. That's a very selfish way to start a relationship. If God has only showed him, then he's, he's got a, a, a problem with the narcissism. Uh, yeah, I, I would run from that as fast as you can. Can, can there be more than one? Basically, how many people can God have made for you? Well, I think, I think the audience has answered that. Um, but I think it's a good question. I think, I think what the real question is, is I don't, is it important you know, the, I could marry this one, or could marry that one, or that one. Or is, does God have one in mind for me? Well, I would take the position that, that God has the very best for you. I would take the position that God has one for you. And you don't want to jeopardize that one by taking action ahead of time with, with another. So I think it's a good question, it really is, and uh, that's, that's the response. What advice can you give to a lady if her husband is basically unfaithful? Well, and it's more specific than that. I, the question is, uh, w w should I still sleep with him? No. I don't want that sexually transmitted disease. Do you? I, I, would, I would want uh, to have assurance that, that, um, that there is no risk of that, that that relationship is long gone, uh, trust has been betrayed, it's been broken, 
and it will take a long time for that trust to be rebuilt. So you need not be held hostage by a domineering, selfish man. But don't use that statement as justification to take uh, action that you shouldn't take. I'm just saying you take action uh, to protect yourself from the diseases that he is, is taking risk to, to obtain. Uh, here's, here's a question. Uh, Debbie, Debbie told me, what will you do if someone asked, uh, asked this question? So she knows what the question is, but it relates to uh, the intimate life. And uh, I would just refer you back to Hebrews 13.4. Was it Hebrews 13.4 or 3? Anyway, uh, that's between a husband and a wife uh, to determine. Um, somebody has a question? Oh, good. <laughs> We're almost done because of this, we can't go forever. What's the stand of the church when such, when a woman is not legal, explaining what, what's adultery? What does it mean to marry, marry another woman's husband and so on and so forth? There's the act of adultery and there's the state of adultery. The act of adultery, you know what that is? Uh, and there's the state of, of adultery. You're, you're uh, living with one who is not your husband. The woman of Samaria is, the, is the, uh, an example of that. And Jesus said, the one you now have isn't your husband at all. The one five husbands back uh, would be your right husband, assuming that that uh, first one hadn't been married before. And so it, it gets complicated. So I hope the young people are listening to some of these complicated uh, situations that arise later so you don't get yourself in, into the same situation. I think this question, uh, what, what measures can be taken, we're trying to take the measures right now uh, to help uh, healthy marriages uh, come about. Okay, a marriage of convenience. Uh, you know, is it fraudulent in the sight of God? Well, I like that question too. A marriage of convenience being uh, you don't love each other. You got married because you wanted to uh, share a house payment or, or, or whatever. So that's a marriage of convenience, I, I suppose, is that kind of a thing. Well, I don't, I don't care if it's a marriage of convenience or not a marriage of convenience. It's a marriage. They too shall be one flesh. So God blesses that union. When a, when a man and a woman each marry for the first time, that marriage is recognized in heaven. It's blessed of God. Some will later say, well, I was, you know, we were mismatched. You were blessed of God. That marriage was sanctioned in heaven. So what God has blessed is blessed. It may take measures on your part to help it to be all that it ought to be, but um, it's a marriage. On finance, what should our wife assist the husband to pay the bills at home? Well, when should the husband assist the wife to pay the bills at home? It could go either way. That's up for the couple uh, to determine between themselves as to how that comes about. That is the end of the questions. How do you manage conflict? I made, I made this question. Conflict will arise in a, in a healthy marriage. The problem isn't that conflict arises. The, 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 the challenge is how you respond to the conflict. You can re respond productively or you can respond destructively. So if you respond productively, the marriage will grow stronger and stronger over time as you learn to, to uh, respond productively. If you bring out the flame thrower and you shock and awe and verbal flames tossed, then that's destructive. It, it will not benefit. But if you find your way through it uh, productively and uh, then, then you'll be stronger for it.
the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Darrell. He's still around. He's going to be with us till the oh, end. <laughs> He's going to be with us till the end of the camp. Um, perhaps you still have anything to clarify. Please feel free to. Um, <laughs> and if you come to me, I will direct you to him. Okay, God bless you all. Thank you so much. I think we really enjoy that. And I want to believe that it has answered so many questions, concerns, that I want to believe some of us may have. Um, the only thing I just want to add is that in our minister's manual, some of the points that Brother Dare made concerning the premarital counseling, we have all those questions given to pastors that are counseling those who want to marry, that we go through with them when they come to us um, too. But obviously, both all leaders, pastors, and um, everyone has, has gained a lot from this afternoon, and we see it as a great blessing. So we say a big thank you to our Superintendent General for taking the time. Okay, Brad Shane will come forward, give us a song to sing together. And then we have our closing prayer before we get ready for um, our meal at 5 p.m. But after that closing prayer, perhaps you must have had a few things that I want to believe you want to take to the Lord in prayer. I think I will encourage you, both married and unmarried, to take advantage of that. Except, of course, you want to run after Brother Darrell to ask that burning questions you may have. Otherwise... We will expect that we fall on the altars or wherever we can find ourselves to pray about this point that God has exposed to us this afternoon. Shall we stand up, please? Prashim. 579. 579. We're going to sing verses 1, 5, and 6. 579. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness and mercy that has followed us. We thank you for this wonderful marriage seminar. Bless our homes. We pray for all the young people from the beginning in the garden 
you created Adam and Eve. Lord, we know the one that fits them. Lord, provide for them. Amen. Those who are still waiting, Lord, give them the bone of their bones and the flesh of their flesh. Amen. Homes that are troubled, Lord, breed in the homes. Amen. Breed love in the homes. Amen. Breed love in the heart of the husbands. Breed love in the heart of the wives. Bless every one of us. Bless the remaining meetings. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray.